we really do not like the word sin. We like to evade it. That's something we can see in others. Uh, you take any hot button topic of our day today, and there are some big ones, right? I don't even have to name them, and you'll come up with probably five to ten of them on your hand, just with our heightened climate and our culture. Just name it. And when you think about the things that we all are passionate about, and especially when you think about following Christ and how that plays out, um, I think this is just an amazing, amazing temptation today to evade our own uh, participation in sin and the different things that we experience. In fact, there's lots of evidence that I can see in myself and in those around me and in our political scene that want to even use the name of God and his person to um, justify uh, going after the sin in someone else, um, but maybe not thinking about what's close to home. Humility. Psalm 139. And when I had to read Psalm 139 into a mirror and looking at myself, I got to tell you that um, during the reading of that and um, at the end, after the prayer of God, search me, examine me, see what's in me, the wickedness, and um, I was um, drawn into powerful silence. Um, speechless. As God revealed to me my heart. The biblical truth about sin is on full display today. Oh, it's been that way in every culture. Uh, sin has been here since, right, early on in the creation of all things. It's been with us. And the reality is that everything that sin touches dies. That is a strong biblical concept. And what's so heinous about sin is that sin will kill, and then it reproduces itself. Wow. Laura begins chapter 2 with uh, telling a vulnerable story of when she had a problem with something, and it had to do with not sleeping very well and being perpetually tired. And part of the difficulty was just acknowledging that there was a problem to the point that she actually would go and try to find some help. So one day, she finally decided to pull on, as she uh, terms it, her big girl pants and engage in a sleep study. And as she describes it, it seemed to me that uh, there was something involved in this step for her of deep humility. Um, and, you know, these kind of things in our life, right, where we're not sure if we need some help uh, or we want to seek help or ask for help, um, we're all familiar with this. We all are. She just had this attitude, I'm perpetually tired, so I need to ask help to seek the fulfillment of my need. It's essentially what she was communicating. So it all began with coming face to face with the acknowledgement that there was a problem. Um, and that problem needed to be addressed, and this led to her taking steps to address it. Um, this is a fantastic correlation to our relationship with God. Um, this past week we discovered, or I hope we discovered, once again, or for the first time, that we are known and we are loved. And part of that knowing of us by God is that God knows we're broken. And a big step certainly is acknowledging, and I'm going to use the word sin, the sin that's in our heart and in our lives, and God already knows it's there. Um, and acknowledging it and being willing to step away uh, or turn our back on the obstacles or the hurdles that keep us from doing that. Uh, to just having a holistic relationship with God was where it starts, and then to be able to begin to pursue that with e everyone around us, all right? Everybody. And um, those hurdles are pride and fear and stubbornness, uh, our own denial, um, the self-righteousness that's within all of us, or just the uh, desire to escape and to hide. All of these things are true for every one of us. Uh, we all have it. And we're all sickened by it. 
So through acknowledgement of the problem and seeking the help that she needed through this sleep study and the treatments that came, uh, she is no longer profoundly and perpetually tired. She is sleeping well and she loves the way that she feels. It seems to me that it all began with humility and this now has led to her no longer being profoundly and perpetually tired and she actually loves how she feels. Every single one of us shares the deep reality of this need. It's fundamental to our human existence and that is the reality of sin and the need for it to be acknowledged and then to enter into something different or a new life in Jesus Christ. And that's what Ephesians, the entire book, is all about, um, as well as the whole motivation and direction of Scripture as a whole. We can never say, ever, like, you have it, you have it, you have it, but you don't, uh, or I don't. Uh, that just can never be said. It's true for every human being. So, what Laura identifies in her book, I think, are good ways to frame it. She identifies this fearfulness, defensiveness, criticalness, bitterness, selfishness, that these are some of the issues that we all share in this thing that I'm going to label plainly and biblically sin, that lead to deeper needs in us for longing um, of something that needs to be filled. We all know that things are not the way they're supposed to be. So how are we going to together to get to um, the answer? The first step is simply begins with acknowledgement, all right, um, admitting. Um, in the Christian faith, we, we call this confession or repentance. Um, those type of concepts and words apply here. Um, that when we think about our fearfulness, our defensiveness, our uh, criticalness, bitterness, selfishness, that simply the first step is to acknowledge them and then to confess them freely, um, knowing that God knows us and loves us. The context of last week sets the stage for us to be able to come to God in this way. The second step uh, is just as essential, and I see that in today's chapter. And that is um, that we need to then surrender. Essentially, it's about surrendering our will to God's will. And it may not even be always our inclinations always of even how we respond to things or how we think things should be done. Uh, we have to be open all the time to God's leading because, you know, Jesus' teaching is absolutely uh, upside down and just changes uh, the reality uh, that we think needs to happen. Um, so, you know, did you notice in Ephesians the repetition of Jesus being at the center of uh, the verses that I read. Uh, Paul is communicating that Jesus must be, needs to be, uh, has to be, for uh, to be at the center of any true uh, redemption or reclamation, reclaiming, or any kind of reconciliation processes. So, you know, the things that we're facing today, um, if we want true reconciliation, then Jesus has to be at the core of it. Because this has nothing to do with revenge. It has nothing to do with trying to seek power uh, about lording uh, one person over another. It has everything to do with surrendering to the will of God. Um, to be willing to lay down your life for your neighbor. I, I mean, all these radical teachings of Jesus apply. And then how can we institute that into our lives together? The way we speak with one another, the way we respect one another. Um, people who are like us, people who are not like us, people who agree with us, people who disagree with us. You know, the way we do that really matters. And um, boy, people are looking at us right now. Uh, you follow Jesus? Well, what does that look like? Uh, what, do you, what am I seeing? Um, to take up Jesus' yoke, to follow him, to drink and eat of him, to surrender to the work of the Holy Spirit, all these things is all about not my will but yours be done, God. It's about surrender. So humility, acknowledgement, surrender. 
And this is in the context of a loving God who knows all this already. We, we just need to simply come. So here's what's going to happen this week in the practices that Laura is going to give us. Her main intention with them is this, to lead broken people toward wholeness, not toward judgment or shame, but towards wholeness. So here are a few practices that we will engage in this week from Laura's book. Uh, practice one, explore what does the living God say about God and Jesus and what does it say about you? And you'll be looking at chapter one of Ephesians. Another question, um, we'll be asked to explore the Trinity. How does this chapter describe the person and activity of each person in the Trinity? So as you read uh, this section from Ephesians 1, what does it say about Jesus? What does it say about God the Father? What does it say about the Holy Spirit? And then um, how does each one of them work in our lives? Uh, another one, where is the passage? Uh, where in the passage are the words, we, us, our, you, spoken? And what is said about it? And then put yourself in those descriptions by name. And then how does that impact you? Uh, pray a prayer to another practice. Uh, Laura has crafted a prayer from Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. And you simply insert yourself in the pronouns or insert someone else in the pronouns. Uh, why don't you insert your enemy in the pronouns and just see how uh, that uh, works. And, you know, do it in front of a mirror. I actually think that has pretty uh, deep impact. Uh, finally, you know, there are profound mysteries about God and the person of Jesus revealed by Paul in Ephesians 1. Um, a question is asked, can you find any grand revelations that make you wonder? Folks, uh, the more we put into this, the more we'll get out of it. And Laura's asking us, and I am asking us, let's uh, go a bit deeper in our daily devotional life with these things. All right. See you soon.